Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast from History to Action. I'm Judy O'Rourke of Labroots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Labroots.com is the leading scientific social networking site, and we're proud to bring you this interactive virtual meeting. For more information, visit us at labroots.com. Here's how this presentation works. We want to hear from you. Questions, comments, and even answers can be submitted via the green Q&A button at the lower left of your screen. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you can't hear or see this presentation properly, let us know by clicking on the support button at the top right or the Q&A button in the lower left. This is an educational virtual meeting and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the meeting is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your web page and follow the process of obtaining your credits. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Bruce R. Korf, MD, PhD. Dr. Korf is the Wayne H. and Sarah Cruz Finley Chair in Medical Genetics, Professor and Chair of the Department of Genetics, Director of the Heflin Center for Genomic Sciences at UAB, and Co-Director of the UAB Hudson Alpha Center for Genomic Medicine. He's a medical geneticist, pediatrician, and child neurologist, certified by the American Board of Medical Genetics in Clinical Genetics, Clinical Cytogenetics, and Clinical Molecular Genetics, the American Board of Pediatrics, and the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology in Child Neurology. Dr. Korf is past president of the Association of Professors of Human and Medical Genetics, past president of the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, and current president of the ACMG Foundation for Genetic and Genomic Medicine. His complete bio is found on the Labroots website. I will now turn it over to Dr. Korf for his presentation. Production, um, just trying to get my slides to <clears throat> come up. Here we go. First, these are my disclosures, none of which have um, relevance to the talk that I'll be giving this morning. So my job is to introduce the concept of family history in the context of genetic testing. Uh, so we'll briefly review the basic elements of family history, uh, try to remind you of the major patterns of genetic transmission then talk about some of the risks, benefits, and limitations that uh, are relevant in genetic testing, emphasize the importance of pre- and post-test counseling, and then how the results could have implications for other family members. Now, one thing I won't do is go into details of the nuts and bolts of genetic testing itself, and I think this is something that will be covered by other speakers in the course of the day. I'm going to begin with a made-up case, and actually you'll see this case um, as a kind of thread through the discussion over the course of the next few minutes. So this is a 38-year-old woman, Lois, who's being seen for routine GYN care, and in the process mentions that she's heard about possibility of genetic risks for breast cancer and is particularly concerned because her sister actually was recently diagnosed with breast cancer. And actually, there are other relatives on her father's side who have had breast or ovarian cancer. And for that matter, there's also cancer on her mother's side. So with the family history and the fact that she's heard about the possibility of genetic testing, she asks her gynecologist whether this is something that should be considered. I we'll have to go back to very basic biology here for just a moment to remind you of some sort of fundamentals of um, human genetics. It begins with the fact that we're diploid organisms. That means we have two copies of every chromosome, except for the sex chromosome. So the non-sex chromosomes are called the autosomes. And you'll recall that females have two X's and males have an X and a Y. And if we kind of zero in on any particular gene, an individual can have the same form of a given gene on both copies of the chromosome inherited from each parent. We call that uh, that they would be homozygous or the two copies may differ in some way that we refer to as heterozygous and the two individual copies are referred to as alleles. 
what I've just described is the genotype, the particular form of the various alleles uh, given genetic locus. And this in turn might determine a phenotype. In this case, for example, blue eyes versus brown eyes. So the genotype in fact informs the phenotype. So let me remind you all briefly of the major patterns of genetic transmission. First, autosomal recessive. In an autosomal recessive, both alleles need to be altered by some genetic variation. Again, we refer to that as there being homozygous. And when an individual is homozygous for a pathogenic um, allele, in this case, little a, uh, they would be affected by that condition. If they're heterozygous, which is shown in the middle on the left, that individual will not manifest the phenotype because it requires both alleles to carry the variant in order to see a phenotype. And of course, if they're homozygous for the unaltered version of the allele, they will be unaffected. So if you look at the family tree on the right, uh, remember that females are depicted as circles, males as squares. The affected child in the lower right is homozygous for little a. Uh, we indicate the phenotype of the fact that the symbol is, is completely filled in. There are two siblings who are heterozygous and therefore are carriers, but are not expected to be affected. And then there's a sibling also who inherits the dominant non-affected allele from both parents will also be unaffected. And the parents themselves are heterozygous carriers unaffected with the phenotype. In contrast, a dominant trait is one that will be expressed either in the heterozygous or homozygous form. So big A here shown as a red allele to indicate that it would be associated with a particular phenotype. An individual can be affected either in the homozygous or the heterozygous form. Only the homozygote for the little a unaffected allele will have no phenotype at all. So if you look at the pedigree on the right, you'll notice heterozygous individuals are shown as filled in and phenotypically affected. They have a 50% chance of transmitting the dominant affected allele to any offspring. Doesn't matter if it's a male or female who's transmitting, or for that matter, a son or a daughter who inherits the allele. Notice that all of the affected individuals in this family are heterozygous. None of them are homozygous. There are a few reasons for that. One is that if this is a rare allele, it will be a rare event for an individual to be homozygous for the mutated or variant um, dominant allele. And actually in human genetics, it often turns out that the homozygote for medically significant pathogenic variants often is more severely affected, sometimes even so, so much so as to be lethal. Well, the third major mode of transmission is X linkage. And this refers to gene loci that are on the X chromosome. So again, remember males have an X and a Y, therefore only a single X. And then a recessive trait shown at the top where the male has the little a um, variant allele, he will be affected because his Y chromosome doesn't have a version of that allele. For a female to be affected by an X-linked recessive, she needs to be homozygous, shown at the lower right, and that is going to be a relatively rare event as compared to um, an affected male. So the most typical form of transmission shown in the pedigree at the right is carrier females who are heterozygous, have a 50% chance of transmitting the allele uh, to either offspring. If a male inherits it, he is likely to be affected. If a female inherits it, she is going to be a carrier depicted here by the little dot in the symbols and a female therefore has a 50% chance of transmitting to a son who will be affected and a 50% chance of transmitting to a daughter who will not be affected. The key in X linkage is you never ever get male to male transmission because of course males transmit a Y to their sons and not the X. If a male is able to reproduce, which will be the case for many X linked traits, all of his daughters will be affected because he has only that single X chromosome to transmit. So in summary, I won't read all of this to you, uh, but just remind you that an autosomal recessive, parents are carriers, SIBs will be affected, 
whereas a dominant will be transmitted from generation to generation. And an X-linked recessive has no male-to-male -male transmission uh, with the trait being transmitted through carrier females. Now this slide I don't intend to narrate in any detail. Um, it is a summary of the various pedigree symbols that are used and you can refer to this later and um, also there's a reference provided. This is based on standardized pedigree nomenclature and the original uh, reference is shown at the very bottom. Let's go back to our case now. And uh, so Lois has referred to a genetic counselor and a detailed family history is obtained um, concerning cancer. And it's shown here in this slide. And um, Lois is um, at the um, lower right. Let me see if I can activate the pointer here. And um, oops, there's Lois right there. And um, her sister is affected and her symbol is um, filled in in um, that sort of um, greenish color. Um, it's on her father's side, as you'll notice, where the um, other individuals with either breast, ovarian, um, or I believe there's one individual with prostate cancer are to be found. On the uh, mother's side of the family, uh, there also is cancer um, in the form of um, lung cancer or leukemia. So a few tips just to keep in the back of your mind in terms of um, pedigree analysis. Um, oh, before we do that, I guess there's a um, question that um, we're gonna ask. So let me um, pause here and, and ask the question, what would you tell Lois based on this family history, either that she shouldn't worry as the cancer is on the father's side um, that there's perhaps not enough risk of cancer to be concerned, uh, she should consider being tested, um, or she should um, consider being tested for either breast ovarian cancer or lung cancer. So let's take a moment, let um, people indicate their choices, and then we'll move on. Well, this obviously wasn't too hard a question. So indeed, um, there is um, significant risk of hereditary breast and ovarian cancer here. Um, and we'll get to um, the fact that this is on the father's side, but that really doesn't um, change our counseling. Well, let me just proceed with um, a few tips about pedigree analysis. Um, and we'll get to the ver at the very end to kind of where this fits into practice. but. Uh, do you remember to ask about deceased relatives? People often won't volunteer information about relatives um, who are no longer alive. Um, you want to um, ask about miscarriages or stillbirths. Um, it's relevant to know about ancestry. Um, often individuals will have had multiple partners that they won't remember to mention if you don't ask. Consanguinity, um, people being blood relatives is important to consider um, and it's worth considering too that people may actually have a better success at assembling family history prior to the visit. So I mentioned genetic counseling. Uh, genetic counselors will have completed a two years master's degree program. They're certified by the American Board of Genetic Counseling. They tend to work in all different settings, um, prenatal, pediatric, adult cancer genetics, um, often in laboratories, um, sometimes in research contexts as well. So the counselor explains that the family history indeed indicates an increased risk of hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. Genetic testing then can be arranged. And she explains to Lois the risks and benefits of testing as well as the costs and what the actual procedure would be. So what are some of the risks and benefits of genetic testing? Um, among the risks, there may be anxiety associated either with waiting for results or, of course, with um, what the results indicate. Uh, there may be costs involved. We'll talk um, a bit more about that. Um, the possibility of false negative results. Again, I'll talk more about that. Or variants of unknown significance. And then 
related to costs, of course, um, insurance issues. On the positive side, the benefits could be information that guides risk management, particularly if an individual tests positive, and then the peace of mind that may occur from negative testing. And of course, the results may have relevance not only to um, individuals, but to family members. Many people are concerned that results of genetic testing might put them at risk of discrimination. And you should know that there is federal legislation in the form of the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, which prohibits the use of genetic information. That includes even family history information and the results of genetic testing, either for health insurance or employment decisions. It does not cover long-term disability or life insurance, however. And many states have additional legislation in addition to this. So I mentioned the possibility of false negative results. So that would imply uh, that an individual um, tested negative, but may still be at risk. And why could that occur? Um, a few possibilities are uh, one that there may be various different genes that cause the same phenotype. And if you don't test the right genes, then you're of course not going to identify a variant that could be relevant to an individual's uh, medical situation. Second, um, in some cases, depending on what the particular assay is that is used for testing and the particular spectrum of variants, um, it's possible that not all pathogenic variants may be detected by a particular assay. There are certain assays, for example, that rely on sequencing but might miss structural changes in the gene. And it's important for the lab to have a pretty good handle on what the sensitivity of their test is and to be able to quote that. And you may find different labs uh, will have different test sensitivity depending on the particular way that they do the testing. But the important point to remember is that a negative result from genetic testing may not eliminate all possibilities of genetic risk. There may be residual risk. So one should not walk away from negative testing and assume that the results indicate that there is no risk whatsoever. And that residual risk will be a very important part of both pretest and post-test counseling. And of course, non-genetic factors are not addressed by genetic testing. And there may be many risk factors that account for whatever's being tested for cancer in this case, but of course, other things as well, um, which would not be addressed by genetic testing. The other point I mentioned as, as a risk is that of a variant of unknown significance. And I find this is the probably single most common source of misinterpretation of genetic tests. And here the lab will return that a variant is present, but its pathogenicity is unknown. So what are the possibilities here? Um, one is that it may be a benign variant, which means that, yes, it's a variant, something different than what is typically seen in the gene at that particular region of the gene, um, but that it has no significant impact on phenotype. And if you think of reading the genetic code almost like reading the words of a book, you could use the metaphor that genetic testing is like scanning a you know, thousand page book looking for a typographical error. And you know that there are examples um, where there could even be alternative spellings of a word. A, a kind of a good example, I think, is the word gray spelled G-R-A-Y or G-R-E-Y. Um, you would certainly have no trouble knowing what the author meant to say, uh, regardless of how that was spelled. And so um, it is very similar in the genetic code that um, there are examples of variants that are really there, but don't have any impact on health in any manner. And occasionally we run across variants um, where we just can't be sure whether this is or isn't pathogenic. It's possible that some of these are rare pathogenic variants, haven't been seen before in the affected population or in the general population. So how does one resolve whether a variant of unknown significance is pathogenic or not? Well, one looks to see if it's in population databases. There are many now. 
uh, where you can look and see is this a variant that has been reported before or not. Uh, but you need to realize that it is very possible that it hasn't been reported before and is still benign. Um, you can infer the expected effect on the gene product. That is, is it likely to be disruptive of the function of the gene or not? And there are various computer programs that will do that, and they're very useful, but at the same time, you need to remember they're just models, and so they, they don't guarantee uh, that a result that says pathogenic is going to be pathogenic or the opposite. Uh, we often look for evolutionary conservation. So if you look at the particular um, variant and you find that that base of the DNA sequence has been conserved from humans down to fruit flies or yeast even, that implies it's quite important and probably variation at that site is not tolerated um, because it wouldn't have been conserved in evolution otherwise. Um, once again, something can be conserved but not necessarily pathogenic, so one shouldn't view that as, as um, proof of pathogenicity, but it's certainly useful. A very useful way to look at this is familial segregation. Is everybody in the family who's affected also found to be a carrier of that variant and everybody in the family who's not affected, not a carrier? Even that's not infallible. Of course, if the family is small, there may not be enough people to test um, if it's a condition that's only appeared in one generation, that won't work. Um, but on the other hand, um, it can be a useful way of at least helping to lend credence. Um, so, and then finally, other cases can be extremely valuable. If you find a variant and it's been seen in 10 other people with the same condition, uh, that gives you a, a much higher level of confidence that you're dealing with something um, that truly is pathogenic. But I, I make this point and emphasize it in some detail because um, I can't tell you how many people we have seen in clinic who ended up having genetic testing interpreted by a clinician who was not sophisticated about genetics and um, was told that they actually have the condition because a variant of unknown significance was reported. And then you see them sometimes years later and realize that they've been carrying a diagnosis that is inappropriate. Um, so I guess the bottom line is that if the lab reports a variant of unknown significance, what that is, is it's a variant of unknown significance, um, not known to be pathogenic, nor is it proved to be non-pathogenic. So it shouldn't be used as a basis for clinical decision-making. What about the costs of testing? Well, it's hard to give a single answer here. Um, it varies with the test, um, including the complexity of that test and the kind of volume. You know, if it's a test that's done very frequently with large volume, there are economies of scale, that may reduce the cost of testing, whereas a customized test for a very rare trait might be fairly expensive to do. Um, it obviously depends on the lab and the specific technology that they use. And then the question, is this covered by insurance? And as with anything else in medicine, it depends on what the specific policy is that an individual is covered by. And um, it's certainly a wise thing before testing is sent to explore what the actual coverage would be for that individual. Even the same company may have different policies that are written for different people, depending on who's buying the coverage, different employers, for example, and what might be covered by a given carrier for one person might not be with another if their policy was purchased through some different mechanism. So really um, would be very wise to check um, with each one. Some companies will have specific conditions under which a test would be covered, depends on what the degree of family history is. Uh, many actually require formal genetic counseling before testing. Um, so pre-authorization is really a very good idea. Um, and it certainly may well be the case that the patient may have a copay. And that's another thing you wanna to try to figure out in advance because um, sometimes the testing can be fairly expensive and they could be surprised by a bill that they're not expecting. I would emphasize that this is a component of pretest counseling um, done by uh, a medical geneticist or a genetic counselor. Um, so it, it really is embedded in the process and a critical part 
because uh, the last thing you want is um, to see the patient get a very large unexpected bill um, for testing uh, that um, was not described to them in detail before it was done. All right, so um, we are going to return now to this um, family history, and um, this is the family history as you remember it. And um, what was done here is that Lois's sister with breast cancer was tested first, and she turned out to have a mutation in the BRCA1 gene, one of the genes that predisposes to hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. And then Lois is tested and her test turns out to be negative, which obviously is reassuring to her. So I think we have now another of the polling questions. So I'll pause and, and let that be posted. All right, so why test Lois's sister first? So the three choices offered, her sister has better health insurance, testing is routinely covered for those who have cancer, or if her sister is found to have a pathogenic variant, this informs Lois's results. So let's pause and register your votes here. Yeah, I think we can take a look at the results. So um, most of you got um, what I think is the right answer, which is that the result in the sister informs um, Lois's result. Um, is testing routine, routinely covered for those with cancer? And I guess the word routinely, of course, um, is a loaded one. But um, I think, again, this depends very much on the specific coverage. So let me just um, explain a little bit more about um, the um, testing in the sister, and it's mentioned here. Um, in general, and I think this could apply to almost any of the testing we're talking about. Um, certainly it's true for cancer genetic testing. If you can do it, it's better to begin testing with a known affected individual. So in this context, we're talking about testing motivated by family history. And if you can, it's a good idea to start the testing with the sibling in this case, or it could have been another relative. And the reason why is that, remember I mentioned earlier the possibility of false negative results. There are many different genes, and we didn't talk about what specific set of genes might have been offered for testing in this case. Um, very often nowadays we use um, panels of multiple genes, not just BRCA1 and 2, but many others that predispose to breast or ovarian cancer. Uh, but the key here is there are many genes and we don't at this moment know all of them. And a negative result in Lois, if that's the only person we had tested, would leave us unsure if we had covered the gene that was relevant for her family. Whereas by testing the sister and finding that she indeed does have a BRCA1 mutation, we can rest comfortably then that that accounts for the family history um, of breast and ovarian cancer with very high probability. Certainly it does in the sister. And that implies that the father must have been a carrier or at least was probably a carrier based on the family history. So a negative result in Lois is really reassuring. But if we didn't know that the family history was accounted for by this particular variant, and we tested Lois and she was negative, there would always be a little bit of uncertainty. Did we test the correct genes? And so here, we can feel reasonably comfortable that we did and that her result really does indicate that she's not at risk for the breast and ovarian cancer on her father's side of the family. So what difference does this make, you might ask? Um, does it help her? And I can say that when testing for risk of uh, breast and ovarian cancer was initiated, which was in the 90s, not too long after the genes were identified, uh, there was real question as to does this really make a difference? Does it change an individual's outcome in some way to have identified that they're at risk? And you know, there was this perception, well, maybe you've just told her the name of the thing that she might or might not develop, um, but can you really do much for her? And I think over the years, in this screenshot of a paper from the New England Journal of Medicine, just one example, 
there really is overwhelming evidence that there is a benefit to testing. In this case, it could include surveillance, um, enhanced surveillance, maybe with MRI, uh, looking for risk of cancer. Um, surgery has been demonstrated to be an effective way of mitigating risk of breast and ovarian cancer. That's the point of this screenshot. Uh, the individuals um, at the top are those who um, underwent um, surgery, actually salpingo ovarectomy, um, and had a much lower risk of cancer than those who were just observed by surveillance, um, which is the bottom curve. And the farther down these curves go, uh, indicates um, individuals who did develop cancer. So surgery can be an effective approach. Uh, there are chemo prevention approaches. Um, and of course, the impact of a test also um, can include that you can provide genetic counseling for the individual um, and through their family. One of the questions that comes up um, is, should children be tested? Um, and you know, in a family like this, um, now Lois um, may be at risk of um, transmitting, or actually not Lois, but a, another member of her family um, who carries this could have been at risk of transmitting uh, the trait to a child. And um, should you test the children for, in this case, risk of cancer? Well, this has been thought about a fair bit. Um, and the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics and um, the American Academy of Pediatrics have issued um, policy statements recently on this point um, in a joint statement. And the agreement in the community has been that the preeminent concern should be the best interests of the child. And in particular, um, to offer testing for children if the child will realize clear medical benefits at that point in time, not in the future when they're grown up, but right then and there. Uh, and generally, we would say that's not the case, say, for risk of breast and ovarian cancer, because children do not develop cancer due to any of the genes known to be associated um, with this, or at least not the major ones, like the BRCA1 and 2. And so in that case, it's recommended to wait until the child is grown up and has a chance to understand risks and benefits of testing and make their own decision about testing. Although I will make the point that one needs to remember that this is an, an issue that um, they do need to ultimately be counseled about. Um, now, there are examples of many genetic tests where it does answer an important question for the child um, that even includes some risks of cancer, certain genes associated with cancer, including some associated with breast and ovarian cancer, um, or at least breast cancer especially, could occur in children. And if those kinds of results are found, like p53 mutations, for example, uh, then you would actually offer testing at a younger age because surveillance actually might be relevant um, for certain of these genes in childhood. So it very much depends on whether the child is going to benefit in the immediate term as opposed to whether we're dealing um, specifically with um, adult onset traits. So how does this all translate into practice? Um, we often make the point of, well, how useful a three-generation pedigree actually is, um, and we wish that it would be a routine part of care, but the reality is that it takes time to generate a complete three-generation pedigree, and chances are pretty good that in day-to-day -day practice, it's not going to be easy to assemble that kind of thing. Now, there are tools available, the Surgeon's General tool, for example, which is publicly available, and um, people can be encouraged uh, to go online and to develop their own family history that way, and it will help to guide them in terms of the things that they might want to draw to the attention of their physician. Uh, but we realize that it's difficult to fit a full three-generation pedigree into the very time-constrained um, primary care or even special specialty care visits that typically occur. But there are some key questions that can be asked that don't take very long and can at least be a kind of segue into um, re recognizing relevant family history. Major medical problems in first-degree relatives defined as parents, sibs, or offspring. Early deaths in the family um, due to disease, that is death at an early age or unexplained sudden death would be some of the kind of 
red flags that you'd want to be paying attention to. Um, a bit more on, on red flags. Um, there are a set of conditions or classes of condition really um, where you may discover things that could be of great relevance um, for uh, the individual health of your patient. Cancer, we've spent a fair bit of time on in this um, talk today. Uh, the kind of red flags here are individuals with early onset cancer earlier than what would be typical for the general population for that particular kind of cancer. Multifocal cancer, a person that gets a breast and ovarian cancer or um, gets cancers in multiple organs, um, not due to metastasis, but due to independent primaries. Um, and particularly be alert to um, breast, ovarian, colon, and thyroid cancers. That's not a complete list of cancers that are associated with genetic risk by any means, uh, but those are some of the major ones uh, for which testing is available. Uh, so these are the kind of signatures, you might say, of hereditary risk of cancer. In the category of connective tissue disorders, um, aortic dissection or aneurysm can have a genetic basis and genetic testing uh, for many of the forms that are inherited can be available. So that would be worth asking about. Cardiomyopathy or arrhythmia, perhaps presenting a sudden death, often has a hereditary basis and can be really life-saving to recognize that risk in an individual um, so as to avoid the um, sort of unexpected event, say, of an arrhythmia. Hyper, excuse me, hypercholesterolemia, I think a pretty well-known risk factor um, for disease that can be familial, uh, worth asking about. And we won't go into detail about pharmacogenetics. Remember that there are genetic variants that affect the way drugs are metabolized. They may cause um, drugs to be metabolized unusually rapidly, which depending on whether the metabolism inactivates the drug or activates it, uh, will lead to aberrant blood levels. Uh, there are actually genetically controlled reactions that must occur um, to activate certain drugs. Um, so there's a long list of these. Um, it's a highly debated issue in terms of their clinical utility and medical decision-making. However, I mentioned two here that are really important to know about. Um, malignant hyperthermia is an aberrant response to um, a specific combination of anesthetics. And actually it is routine for um, anesthesiologists to ask about a family history because that can be a potentially life-threatening complication of anesthesia. Uh, whether it'll come up in primary care, um, I'm not so sure, but it certainly is part of um, the routine questioning um, pre-anesthesia. And then um, either Stevens-Johnson syndrome or uh, toxic epidermal necrolysis, uh, which is a, a potentially life-threatening um, skin reaction to certain medications. Uh, there are known to be uh, some HLA alleles that predispose to this. In um, Southeast Asia and China, it's actually become routine uh, to test for these. That's not as um, frequently done elsewhere in the world because in that uh, region of the world, a very specific HLA allele uh, seems to account for this risk and actually is routinely tested in some answer, in some places rather, and um, is um, then used to inform who should get a drug that is known to be a, a risk factor uh, for this kind of um, complication. But in other parts of the world, it's a little more complicated in the sense that um, no single wheel has um, a high enough frequency uh, to make it easy to test for. But certainly if it's in the family history, um, it would be highly relevant because certain medications, carbamazepine, just for one example, but many others, um, could trigger this um, reaction uh, to individuals who are at risk. Well, finally, let me just summarize um, and um, emphasize that the family history can be a really critical point of entry to addressing genetic risks in a particular individual. And you don't necessarily need to take a complete three-generation family history. Um, targeted questioning can reveal some red flags uh, that can be a prelude to testing. In many of these cases, then, the follow-up is genetic testing can be arranged. 
to help clarify risks that may lead to a management program for that individual and the ability to offer counseling to other members of the family, but that genetic testing should be accompanied by pre and post test counseling. And there are medical professionals, both genetic counselors and medical geneticists who are available to help with that process. So I think this is the last slide in the presentation and I know that we have a few more minutes and um, I also know that there is a, a queue of questions. Um, so um, I'm glad to pa uh, pause at this point and um, address some of the questions that may have arisen. Thank you, Dr. Kaur, for that presentation. We want to get right to your questions and input. So here's a reminder of how to connect with us. Questions, et cetera, can be submitted via the Q&A button at the lower left. Okay, here's a question from one of our attendees. How do you handle controversial variants that are reported as benign and pathogenic by different teams? There are examples um, where a particular variant, depending on what the um, data set may have been, um, may be interpreted as pathogenic by some and perhaps not by others. Um, you know, here's for sure, I think, where it really helps to have a genetic professional in the loop. And, um, and I think at least the way I handle this is to try to weigh the evidence such as it's presented and um, have a conversation with the individual um, and just lay out what we know and what we don't know. And um, you know, I think it's really hard to answer that generically, but I tended to take the position that uh, we really do need to um, give our um, patients as much information as we have. And the reality is that um, although sometimes the results can be quite black and white, they often are not, and you know we, we have to live with the fact that sometimes there is ambiguity, and depending on what the evidence base is, uh, give our best assessment. And you know there may be instances where we ultimately have to leave the issue um, unresolved, at least at that moment in time, although there is the possibility of further evidence occurring as time passes that may further clarify the issue. What genetic testing should be routinely offered for hypercholesterolemia? I'm not gonna. Yeah, I'm not gonna. Oops, I wasn't sure if I was on. Yeah, I, I'm not gonna get into the um, full details of all the testing. Actually, I, I wouldn't claim to be an expert on um, hypercholesterolemia testing. My background is um, more in um, pediatric neurogenetics, uh, but. Now, there are sources of information about genetic testing that would be relevant to any particular um, trait. And I think some of the um, toolkit that is provided as part of this series can go into details. Um, there, there are various references. Um, um, gene um, reviews would be one that I would recommend uh, to go into full detail about any particular form of testing. What would you recommend to Lois if her sister had not tested positive for BRCA1? So, yeah, it's a good question. Um, the issue there, you know, of course, it might well have been more than just BRCA testing that was offered. Um, so I would expect that we would today do a panel of tests that um, would have included um, a much larger number of um, cancer predisposition tests that um, could be offered. Um, so, you know, we, we, we would have a, a real conversation about what the um, implications are because um, you could take the point of view that um, most probably her sister has whatever the trait is that was segregating in, it was the father's side of the family. Um, and that accounted for risk. I suppose it's possible that there could have been a gene that was um, relevant to other members of the family and that 
you know, coincidentally, her sister ended up developing cancer for completely unrelated reasons. And meanwhile, Lois, in principle, could have inherited some risk allele that other members of the family carried. And um, so you could therefore argue that a negative test result in her sister, even if it was for a comprehensive panel, might have missed a variant that other members of the family carry and could have passed on. Um, so I, you know, we would have had a conversation about that and um, realized that there was a, I think a reasonably high chance nothing would be found. If other members of the father's family were available for testing, that could have been offered. Um, I could imagine that we might still have offered Lois a test, but with a much um, you know, lower likelihood of finding something that would be immediately relevant and um, with a bit more ambiguity attached to a negative result. Lots of great questions coming in. We have time for just one more. How do you feel about the use of genetic testing for disease risk in patients with no personal history who are adopted and have no knowledge of their family history? Right, so um, I guess the question is um, an individual who has no known family history and is concerned about risk, and I guess it depends a little bit on the context there. Um, so, you know, what leads to that concern about risk? If it's the occurrence of a sign or a symptom in that individual, um, then, you know, certainly testing would be indicated. Should an adopted person be tested for, you know, sort of a comprehensive panel of any of the things, for example, that I spoke about, um, I guess right at this moment, I think that would not be um, sort of typical practice um, because uh, when you don't have a kind of a prior probability of risk to work with, um, there's probably a greater chance of finding variants of unknown significance um, in a healthy individual who happens to be adopted and leaving them with ambiguity rather than clarity as to what's going on. There is a lot of debate, I can say, in the um, community about the value of um, testing individuals who are healthy um, for risks of actionable disease that um, if you knew that they actually had one of those risk factors might change their management. And you know the discussions um, occur in the context, for example, of direct-to-consumer testing, which um, is sort of um, an emerging area in this. Uh, discussions about population screening for uh, medically actionable problems. Um, it is not a simple issue, in my judgment at least, um, partly because of the costs of testing, um, all of the various medical follow-up that may ensue to chase down um, variants. Um, we often won't know what the true penetrance is, that is the likelihood of disease uh, when there's no known family history, so you find a variant, but even if it's pathogenic, how sure are you that it will go on to cause disease? Um, and finally, um, the risks of, um, as I mentioned earlier, variants of unknown significance that um, create anxiety without clarity. So there's a lot of things that come up in the context of um, testing at otherwise healthy individual. Um, you know, genetic testing tends to be at its best when there is some significant prior probability uh, that motivates the testing based on family history or based on signs and symptoms, and you're on much more solid ground, screening otherwise healthy people. Um, of course, it happened routinely in newborn screening um, because we have a lot of experience with how to interpret the results and how to verify them and very significant uh, medical actions that can be taken. It's a trickier area, I would say, in um, healthy individual screening. Um, and it's one of a very active discussion in the community. And it wouldn't surprise me if over time uh, we do develop um, the ability to do that, but I don't think it's routine to do at this moment. I would like to once again thank Dr. Korf for his presentation. Do you have any final comments today? individuals speaking over the course of the day who will go into more detail about specific um, conditions and specific risk factors. 
my purpose really was to use this as an example to motivate um, the kind of interest in family history. And I also would just highlight that a toolkit has been um, provided that um, will help individuals um, go into more detail about many of the things that you'll be hearing through the course of the day. I really appreciate uh, the interest uh, that uh, people are showing in this and um, uh, look forward to the presentations to follow. Thank you. This is an educational virtual meeting and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the meeting is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left hand corner of your web page and follow the process of obtaining your credits. You're also invited to join Dr. Korf in the networking lounge right after his talk concludes where he'll be answering more questions. Just go to the meeting lobby, enter the networking lounge. In the lounge, there's a live chat feature where you can type in your questions. If you asked a question this session, it will not transfer to the lounge, so you will have to re-enter your query. Thank you for joining us here at labroots.com, the leading scientific social networking site. For more information, visit us at www.labroots.com. Today's virtual meeting will be available for on-demand viewing on our website through September 22, 2016. We'll let you know when it's been posted, and we hope you pass that information on to any colleagues who couldn't take part in today's broadcast. See you next time. Goodbye.